thanks, Chris. So um, I, I've been attending this meeting, I think, for the last five years uh, on behalf of the company, so it's fun to, uh, to actually get to give the talk this time around. Um, trying to advance, let's see. Yeah, there it goes, okay, great. Um, so we are a publicly traded company, um, and this is our safe harbor statement, as you've seen from many others before. So I may uh, have some forward-looking statements today, and uh, you're encouraged to go to our website for any uh, relevant financials, should you be interested in that. I'll talk a little bit about the company, uh, kind of who we are, uh, what we do, a little bit about how we do that uh, with respect to our, our core technology, and give a sense of where that fits with, uh, in, in terms of applications and markets. And then I'll, I'll touch on a couple of examples, uh, including one uh, of our commercially uh, ready to launch at the end of this year um, tissue targets, uh, and then finish up with a, with a note about uh, the scientific session. So Organovo really is uh, a 3D tissues company, a 3D human tissues company. We certainly use bioprinting to achieve that, to get to that. Uh, but our core area of interest and, and expertise is really in, in 3D uh, biology and understanding how to make better models um, of, of not only human disease but, but of human tissue function um, through, through three-dimensional uh, systems. And, and that's in, in terms of, uh, you know, kind of moving left to right of, of as, I, as I touched on, not only um, just normal uh, human tissue models, but also at, at times um, custom human tissues that may include phenotypic cell populations or particular uh, proportions of cells uh, within a given tissue. And lastly, you know, we really hope to take what we've learned uh, in the process of making those tissues and understanding how they behave uh, in vitro and apply those uh, long term to therapeutic human tissue development. We've had success in printing a wide variety of tissues to date um, in bioprinting um, airway, um, it's denoted in the lung there, um, as well as cardiovascular tissue. We've looked at uh, deposition printing of mesenchymal stem stromal cells in the multipotent state and targeted differentiation of those cells. Um, and I'll talk to you a little bit today about um, both liver um, and oncology in, in terms of breast tissue. Um, the liver tissue will be launched uh, at the end of this year. Um, so, so for those of you who are interested in doing that, um, that will be available. So we actually deposit aggregates of cells, uh, mixed populations or, or pure populations of cells. So that is, they, they can either be um, homotypic, a single cell population, or heterotypic, multiple two, three, four cells uh, within a given aggregate. Those aggregates can take many different forms. Uh, they may be, as it's shown in the cartoon here, spherical in nature. Um, they are typically supported by uh, external hydrogel material that is not an integral portion of the, of the tissue itself, but is simply meant to facilitate tissue fusion and, and development. Um, and then using a very simple graphical user interface, we can make a variety of shapes, right? So in this case, I'm showing a cartoon of a, of a tubular construct that may be linear, that may be a bifurcated tube. We can also play with the planar geometry, that is how do cells, um, how are they deposited within a given plane with respect to one another. And then ultimately we can condition and mature those tissues and start to ask kind of basic questions, right? It can be handled as a normal tissue specimen would and histopathologic uh, analysis can be conducted. We can also do conventional uh, laboratory work, uh, kind of the omics uh, world of things. We think about a couple of things when trying to design um, a successful tissue, whether that's uh, in the context of, of what we're doing internally and internally driven um, or external partner driven relationships. Um, we can push and pull on the bioprinter itself. So whether that's the inputs, whether that's the hardware, uh, the bioprinting platform is certainly malleable. The cell inputs can vary, not only um, for the specific tissue of interest, but perhaps for the outcome of interest. Um, as, as I mentioned before, um, there are certainly indications where we're interested in phenotypic um, cell populations. And then lastly, once you've made that thing, uh, probably the most important component and where we spend a lot of time today is understanding um, the functional assets, right? How do we characterize that in response just to typical maturation, but as well um, in, in terms of perturbation or, or stimulus. And you know, what we're able to do is, is hit a couple of, um, or really many key features um, that we think are important in terms of, of three-dimensional biology, right? So the bioprinting platform as we approach it enables us to get a, a rapid generation of tissue-like cell density. Um, we get true three-dimensionality, right? So these are not just simple monolayers of cells, but rather you know, it's a, a tissue construct that's at least 500 microns in thickness and often uh, thicker. And that we have multiple cell types, multiple populations of cells in spatially defined arrangements within those tissues, which we think is really critical to, uh, to the function 
uh, long term of the tissues that we're able to generate. And we can do that in a highly reproducible automated fashion, right? So we can give replicate tissues uh, in a multi-well plate, for example, so that you can start to interrogate a common uh, tissue type with uh, multiple stimuli. So, uh, you know, with respect to applications and markets in the in vitro space, which we internally call tissue applications, um, we can think of some kind of very, very simple common off-the-shelf uses for these types of things in the predictive toxicology or pharmacology space. Uh, I'll give you an example of that with, in, in terms of liver, um, as well as disease modeling, right? So specific tissue targets, and I'll talk a little bit about that um, with uh, a model of breast cancer. The technology fits well uh, in, in the red uh, box there, in the red gap. We are not a high throughput screening system. Uh, we would consider ourselves, I think, a medium throughput platform. Uh, we fit well after uh, the lead optimization period. So can we, in fact, de-risk? Can we identify targets that, with currently available uh, platforms, wouldn't be detected as potential um, adverse events in the clinic? Uh, and can we, in fact, supplement things that, as, as the process begets, begins to get more expensive, uh, we think we fit well into that space, right? And, and what we really hope to do is to be able to provide systems that are more predictive uh, of the human tissues and, and really of patient populations than what is currently available. So um, I touched on this, and I think it deserves, it, it deserves mention here. We really hope to be able to take what we've learned and, and take our core expertise in three-dimensional biology in the in vitro space and apply that with a longer-term vision um, to, to therapeutic development of supplemental tissues and therapies that, um, you know, that may come in, in any uh, shape or form. Um, but we think that the system, uh, as we're approaching it, fits well uh, into, that, into that process. So I'll touch on a couple of, uh, a couple of key examples quickly. Um, and the first is liver, right? So one of the things that th this uh, approach for 3D bioprinting and fabrication strategies allows us to do is to print um, populations of cells in defined geometric or spatial orientations, right? And, and um, this is seen often in nature, right? So in the liver lobule, for example, you have this polygonal structure, and there are defined parenchymal and non-parenchymal cell populations within those areas. Um, in our liver tissue, we have uh, primary human hepatocytes uh, and a non-parenchymal cell population of endothelial cells and hepatic stellate cells uh, are used to generate our tissues. And this is what those tissues look like at some period of time, um, maturation. So this is a cross-section in, in the upper left. is an H&E stain um, at about five days post-printing. Uh, and you can see that the cells are dense. They're well-organized. They're highly viable. You don't find areas of central necrosis, although this tissue, in, in this case, um, one of the thinner tissues, is actually about 250 microns in thickness. The hepatocytes are very well-organized within the tissues. Uh, you'll find tight junctional protein expression, uh, in this case, Ecadherin in green in the, in the lower left um, with albumin staining. Uh, the hepatocytes are full of, of albumin. Uh, but we also have observed other uh, protein expression as well. And the non parenchymal cells, in this case endothelial cells, um, show organization during that maturation process and, and start to form luminized uh, structures as well. And we can characterize these um, in terms of function. So uh, this is some, some data that we have shown um, that, you know, Primary human hepatocytes plated in 2D culture and standard cell culture assays, whether in just on plastic, coated plastic, or in sandwich culture, they're functional for about 48 hours um, and tend to de-differentiate over uh, the next 48 to about 96 hours. But in our system, uh, we have functionality out to at least 40 days, at which point we kind of terminated the experiments. But as you can see in, uh, in the blue bars here in albumin production, um, the constructs were still very viable. The tissues produced cholesterol which uh, indirectly lets us know that the CYP1A2 system is intact as well. Um, and we can then start to interrogate this, as, we, as, as I mentioned earlier, right? So can we, in fact, put um, hepatotoxic, known hepatotoxic agents into the system? And in the upper left, this uh, tissue was treated with diclofenac and NSAID, which at high concentrations does cause hepatotoxicity. And you can see that uh, in the black bars, CYP3A4 activity decreases as that system becomes overloaded. Uh, and you have a concomitant increase uh, in, in LDH release as a marker of injury. We can also look at other classic markers of hepato injury, um, such as acetaminophen toxicity. Um, you can see the, the viability curve with increasing uh, APAP concentration uh, is as you would expect. And we also have a release of LDH. 
And as I touched on before, what you have with this system, what you've generated, is a three-dimensional tissue, right, that can be handled as a surgical biopsy or surgical specimen might be. And now one can ask questions about what are the cells doing within that tissue, not only with respect to their organization and, and, and arrangement to one another, um, but in response to an insult like acetaminophen, right, which causes necrosis. And as you can see in the, in the H&E images below, um, you see necrosis at that high dose uh, of acetaminophen. We have uh, also played um, with uh, iPSC-derived hepatocyte-like cells, in this case, um, the iCell from CDI. If you were to compare, um, this, the, the bioprinted tissues are in the blue, um, and the CDI iCells are in gray, just plated on plastic. So if you were to compare what those cells do, how they perform when given the proper three-dimensional cues and put in terms of non-parenchymal cell partners, um, you see sustained production of albumin and increased performance over time. Again, this was an experiment that we stopped at 10 days, not that um, the, the function deteriorated at, at that point. Um, but it gives us a good inkling that uh, the, the, the system is flexible, that the platform can accept, in fact, um, non-primary human hepatocytes as well, but in this case, iPSC-derived hepatocyte-like cells. And, and I'll walk you quickly through um, some other work that we're starting uh, to, to get into in earnest now. This is a clever model that was developed by uh, research scientist uh, Shelby King in the lab. Uh, she has looked at a way to really mimic breast tissue uh, with an eye towards understanding how chemotherapeutic agents can access that breast tissue and, in fact, how um, cancerous tissue in the breast might, in fact, metastasize or respond to that agent. So what Shelby has created, what they've worked on in the group, is uh, a surrounding population of, of stroma cells, in this case, uh, dermal fibroblasts, preadipocytes, and endothelial cells, surrounding um, really a, a core of epithelium, and that could be normal or cancerous epithelium, and it also allows us to contemplate a, a personalized medicine approach to things. Um, as you can see in the staining, and the, the upper right, both the h &E and the trichrome, the constructs are very dense and viable. They're well organized. Um, they're quite thick. Uh, if you look in, in the bottom panel, is on the left in panel C. Um, the red is uh, fibroblast markers, so those fibroblasts are still confined to the outside, while ECAD positive epithelium is confined to, to the internal um, structure. And on the outside, um, the, the cells, uh, the CD31 positive endothelial cells, have organized into nice microvascular networks. So we then treated some of those with um, known um, common chemotherapeutic agents such as cisplatin, methotrexate, and paclitaxel, and compared what the response of the 3D tissues is to what MCF7 cells, for example, would, would respond, or how they would respond, rather, um, in standard 2D cell culture. And what you find is this kind of disparate um, response to different chemotherapeutic agents. And it allows us to ask questions about how a common tissue might respond to either combinatorial approaches for therapeutics um, or different molecules, different um, drug uh, uh, drug manipulations. And so I'll, I'll touch um, briefly on how one might think about doing that. If you look up in the panel in A, um, we find uh, the red staining is, is just um, the epithelium. So we know that the, end of the, the epithelial cells rather are confined to the core as we would expect. If we look at a labeled um, just compound, right, so nonspecific compound in B, we know that uh, we can penetrate the entire tissue. But in fact, if we look at what two of those different response um, candidates were, in this case in C with methotrexate or D, paclitaxel, which are two different types of molecules, right? So one is hydrophilic. Uh, methotrexate in C penetrates the tissue very, very well, while lipophilic compound um, like paclitaxel, in fact, aggregates at the outside, right? And it gives us a bit of a differential response to, to those therapeutic agents and allows us to ask questions about how one might approach combinatorial uh, therapeutic regimens as well as understanding how different molecules can access um, tissues uh, and, and not just a, a monolayer of cells. And so lastly, um, we have done some work recently uh, with three-dimensional bone uh, from stem cells with collaborators uh, at UCSF. Um, and Edwin Golez and Kelsey Redding have a poster uh, at the scientific session on Thursday. So I would encourage uh, anyone who is interested to check that out. Um, and with that, um, thank you very much. Thank you.